Life. I cannot wait to catch up with today's guest, Catherine Bertine. We last spoke with Catherine. We would have spoken in December 2015, and the episode came out on January 12th, 2016. So it's been a long time since we've caught up, and I'm just so excited to hear what you've been up to over the past couple of years. But before we get into all of that amazing stuff, for those people who haven't heard the first episode, I'd love for you just to introduce yourself and tell everybody just a little bit more about you and your background. Oh, wow. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's so great to be talking with you again, Sarah. It's been, I can't believe it's four years have gone by, really. I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's scary. It's beyond scary how quickly the time has gone. It, it is. And, and a lot has changed in that time, too. I mean, for the better. But uh, yeah, it's it's been quite the journey. So let's see. How would I define myself? I I suppose I've always worn a lot of hats. And the most that I relate to is that I am an activist, an athlete, an author, and uh, sometimes that also means um, screenplays and journalism and filmmaking, stuff like that. But I would say something in the realms of athlete, activist, author is, uh, is kind, of, kind of what I do. <laughs> Absolutely love it. So last time that we were we were speaking, you were talking a lot about your being a pro racer, your plans for your fifth and final year. We talked a lot about like rest and recovery and, and why women continue to get better and better with age, especially for endurance events and why age is just a number. Take us back to the beginning of 2016 and what happened for you in that year. Great. Okay. So, uh, and this, this stems very well from what we were talking about with um you know, in terms of the endurance and that athletes do get better with age. Um, I, I was 40 in 2015 and then 41 in 2016. And those were my last two seasons of racing and they were my best. They were my strongest, uh, not just because I, you know, had a better mental awareness of what it takes to be a pro cyclist, but physically my body was responding too, And that was fantastic to see that as I was getting older, I was getting better. 2015 was a really, really strong year for me. And then I was very excited to start 2016 on the same note, which I did. And I also remember distinctly saying that 2016 would be my last year racing professionally. And I, I said that in, uh, in January of 2016 with the hope that actually verbalizing my final year early, as opposed to at the end of the season, uh, it kind of gave me an empowerment of saying, okay, this is my last year. I'm going all out. It's going to be awesome. And not having to feel at the end of the season, like, okay, well, that's enough. I'm calling it a day now. I wanted to be really proactive about it and also be very clear so that others would feel empowered. Like, Hey, if we want to dictate our retirement on our terms, it almost feels more empowering to do that at the start of a season rather than at the very end where people might wonder, well, what happened? What went wrong? Why? You know? So <laughs> I, I did that with uh, the intent of saying, okay, I'm going to be 41 this year. I'm on a world tour team. I'm at the highest level of pro racing. I've been going strong and I want to go out on that note rather than always leaving it to luck and chance that everything from teams folding to injury or illness could play a role. I was like, Nope, I'm going to do this on my terms. <laughs> so, so 20, uh, 2016 started out great, started out strong. And then came the big crash in early April of, um, yeah, of 2016. I was down racing the UCI Vuelta Femenil in Mexico and I was involved in a crash that I actually don't remember any of it, but what I'm told is that the woman who was just ahead of me in the Peloton went down and I was the lucky recipient of being right behind her. And it launched me into the, the bottom of the pile of this big pile up. And whereas every other racer got up with road rash and, you know, kind of the, the common symptoms of, of a group crash, I was on the bottom of that pile and I ended up with two skull fractures and in addition, you know, it, which I, I suppose that threw me into seizures and this, uh, this state of affairs left me in quite a conundrum of having a, a massive TBI. Um, again, all of this, I don't recall. I, I woke up three days later and I was in the, the Mexican hospital for the first week 
And then I was medevaced to Arizona, belonged to Arizona, where I was in the hospital for another two weeks. And I was really, really lucky to shorten the story. I was just extremely lucky to make it out of that type of crash without either, you know, severe consequences or death. So I count my, my lucky stars on that. And it's kind of amazing trilogy of doctors and um, people helping me through that is, is really what made it happen. So that was, that's how 2016 began. <laughs> Wow. Oh my God. And for, mm. for those who just the acronym, the TBI is traumatic brain injury. I Correct. mean, what, what was the impact afterwards of going through something like that and, you know, coming out of it and then sort of having that experience? Yeah. So it's an interesting journey through a brain injury is that anybody who's gone through having a, a brain injury, um, it does not mean that all of our cases are the same. It depends where you hit your head, you know, which cortex, which lobe, which everything can have totally different effects. I have friends who have crashed, you know, maybe in training or going at a very slow speed and they bump their head and they get back up and life continues on, yet they have dizziness or, you know, nausea or trouble seeing. And then you have other people who are in like this major race who like, in my case, I was hospitalized for three weeks. I almost died at the scene. Yet now I have very, very manageable um, symptoms like fatigue and uh, which is also, you know, something that's easy to, uh, to, to fix by sleeping, you know? So for me, knowing that I have fatigue and I have to limit my screen time is very, very, um, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm really lucky that those are the lingering symptoms. Um, whereas other people, you know, might have many more severe symptoms. Um, so it's a strange journey through brain injuries. That's kind of where, where mine was. But of course, in that time, after the accident, I was in the hospital for three weeks. I then spent the next two months recovering. I know the next six weeks were on my, I was on my dad's couch and I was on anti-seizure medication in case anything, you know, happened after, you know, during that time. And then it was quite a while before I could, could physically get back on a bike trainer, a stationary trainer, turbo trainer. You know, it was a while before I got the green card that I would be okay neurologically to, to race or even just ride a bike. And it was around that time that I made the decision that since I had already announced it was going to be my year of retirement, I really wanted to get back to one more race that I could do, you know, as a participant slash, you know, pro pro cyclist still be there, you know, um, capable and able to be around my, my competitors and my peers. But I didn't want to end my career on a brain injury. I really wanted to make sure that I ended my career on something that was, um, that was better than that. Something that I remembered. (laughs) So my team said, okay, we will send you to, uh, to one more race. And that was the cascade classic in gosh, was it the end of July or early August of 2016? And I raced three, out of the five stages, but the fourth stage was a criterium stage. And because that stage has the highest possibility of, of crashes, I decided, okay, you know what, that makes sense to sit that one out just in case. Cause if I run that risk or hit my head again, this soon on something devastating could happen. So I retired, you know, at the, at the end slash the middle of that, of that race and said, okay, that's it. (laughs) And I had great support from my teammates on that. They were all, you know, wonderful about it. How did you deal with the fear of getting back on the bike again? I mean, I suppose the weird thing is because you don't remember what happened, just almost like the, the consequences. So did you actually, did you have fear? I had, you know, it's, that's a great question. Um, I didn't have fear getting back on the bike. And I very, um, I very much understood that what had happened was one of those instances that was kind of like a, a freak accident in the world of cycling. Like, you know, it doesn't matter how skilled or how in shape you are. Sometimes when you're in a Peloton, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time and, um, bad stuff happens. And, you know, that was the situation that I was in when I had this crash as opposed to had I caused the crash or had I, I don't know, um, 
not seeing a pothole in the road or something like that, maybe that would have stuck with me as fear in some way. But because it was so chance and, um, you know, a matter of circumstance, I did not have the fear of getting back you know, into the Peloton, especially since I couldn't remember what had happened. But I did have one side effect that my body was clearly sending a message like, oh, I remember what happened. (laughs) And I left a bigger gap when I was racing, you know, this race in in, uh, the summer. Um, It was obvious to me that my body wanted to leave a bigger gap between the person in front of me and where I was riding. And I thought that was really interesting because after spending so many years in the sport, I was very comfortable with how a Peloton rides, how a Peloton, you know, um, how it is. And you have to be, you know, close to the person that you're riding behind. And I thought it was an interesting message that the brain was sending, like, well, we're going to give a few extra inches of space here. And, uh, um, it wasn't enough that I was just gapped off the Peloton. It was just a noticeable amount for me to say, huh, that's interesting. And I kind of respected that. And I did give a little bit more space. <laughs> With your friends and family, because sometimes what I found is that you can end up taking on other people's fears when people are talking to you. And obviously they, they're they almost, they're dealing with, with the aftermath and, you know, seeing you in that position and seeing you in hospital and seeing you recover and, you know, having to go through that. Were they more worried for you going back to the racing? Yeah, I think so. I think that um, my dad, who I'm closest with, you know, in my family, he he was worried and concerned, but he also understood why I wanted to do that final race, and he got it. He understood that for me, that was um, that was a, a you know a symbol of closure, and it brought me a lot of joy and happiness to be back in the peloton. So I think he understood. And I I said, Hey, you've got to trust me that I, um, I will do anything within my power to avoid putting myself in more of an aggressive position, you know, whereas all the way up to that, the race of the crash, I was, you know, going off the front and launching attacks and doing what you're supposed to do as a as a domestique in, at a pro world tour level, you're supposed to be an active participant in the race and making stuff happen. And for that last race, I was more a pack fodder by choice. <laughs> I was not going to initiate stuff. I was going to follow and just kind of see what unfolded. And I think that, um, you know, when I tried to articulate that to friends and family, that that was going to be the course of action. I think it might have made them feel a little bit better, but I have no doubt they were still still scared and nervous about how this could turn out. I mean, what I think is really interesting is almost throughout 2016, it's a year of it's a year of transitions. Like there's a lot of a lot of change going on, you know, transitioning from. Uh, f- from an athlete to to going into, into the hospital to dealing with the, your traumatic brain injury to transitioning back to to health to transitioning back to to doing a race in the summer of 2016 and then the saying goodbye to your athletic pro- professional athletic career and and making that making that change how was that transition i mean i know that you were you you thought about it and you were taking ownership and responsibility for it and you know empowering yourself by deciding when you were going to end it was it still the right decision for you at that time and what was that sort of transition in the months afterwards like yeah great question and the answer is um yes i i was prepared for this transition because not only was I verbally saying, Hey, this is going to be my last season, but I had something else going on behind the scenes. And since I knew that I was going to um, retire from pro cycling, I had all already set the ball in motion for what I wanted to do next. And that was, um, opening a nonprofit organization called the Homestretch Foundation. And uh, before we get into that part, uh, I guess the most, you know, the, the key element of that is that this was a business plan that I began working on in late 2015 and found a business partner to invest in this in, in 2016. So I was trying to create this behind the scenes so that when I did retire, I knew exactly what I was going to be doing next. And that definitely helped the transition. I have seen so many pro athletes um, make the jump from racing professionally or playing professionally in whatever sport that is into um, retirement, but not knowing what comes next. And I've seen them struggle with that. And so um, they unknowingly, 
you know, help guide my decision of saying, okay, when it's time for me to retire from the sport, having something lined up might be the best way to go about making that transition a little bit more seamless. And so that's what happened. So that helped a lot. And then it's also interesting that it played a huge role in the accident itself because the Homestretch Foundation, which you can find out about homestretchfoundation.org, we help female pro cyclists who are struggling with the gender pay gap. And behind the scenes, we launch as many, uh, let's see, how do I put it gently? We launch as many lobbying effects as possible to help change those laws so that we're not a band-aid, but that we're actually help eliminating the hurdles that keep women behind the scenes or keep women back, you know, uh, behind the scenes in UCI, ASO, all of the, the main structures in cycling that are preventing this inequity to happen. We try to lobby and change those rules. And in the meantime, we help the athletes who are struggling. So we have a residence in Tucson, Arizona, where athletes can come and live and train and do their thing for six months, even longer. They can live for free while they're on the uh, the training and racing circuit. And a lot of athletes choose Tucson because it's a great place to be during winter training and prepping for their upcoming UCI seasons. So we help the, we prioritize helping pro athletes who are at the UCI level. They get first dibs, and then we open um, spots for residency to those athletes who are just on the cusp of earning their first pro contract to try to help them get a leg up. So that's what we were, you know, um, we were launching in 2016. We've now been, you know, we're about to start our fourth season, which is really, really exciting. But the interesting part to the the journey um, back with my, my brain injury and being in the hospital, et cetera, was that we had found my business partner and I had found the residence and we were locking down the home stretch property and we were getting everything together. And we had a, um, we had a date to close on the house of April 7th, 2016. And my accident happened on April 3rd. And I was still, you know, on the verge of comatose in the hospital. I was not even conscious or barely awake on April 7th. And my business partner decided he'd go through with it anyway and closed on the house, on the property, in the hopes that I would recover and that my brain would be functional, (laughs) functionable. So to think that all of that was happening behind the scenes, you know, um, and how it all transpired was, uh, and still remains to me, just an amazing testament to the fact that you know, we can have all these plans laid out and this is what we want to do, but then stuff happens. And then it's really this connection of other people that have such an effect on our lives, you know, to, to take that initiative of, you know, whether something is going to happen or not. So it was quite the journey. What's really helped as well is, you know, even sort of how you describe yourself that, you know, at the beginning, you know, you're, you're an activist, you're an athlete, you're an author, you've actually got sort of multiple identities. So your whole identity isn't just tied up in being an athlete. I absolutely love your activism and, and what you're doing. And t- t- I'd love to know more about the Homestretch Foundation, you know. I, I think I understand why you do what you do <laughs> because of yes. inequalities. Um, but, yes. but would you like to like spell that out so it's really, really clear for people what is happening in the world of cycling at the moment, especially for women? Absolutely. Absolutely. I always like to tell people that um, women cycling it remains where women's tennis used to be back in the 1970s. We have this very antiquated governing body that has not um, seen the light. (laughs) They have not yet grasped the concept that when you invest equally in women, then not only does the women's sport flourish, but the entire sport flourishes. You know, I think for so many of us, we can't imagine what it would be like just seeing you know, men's tennis. Of course, we're so ingrained in seeing men's and women's tennis playing equally. And when I say playing equally, I mean, they get equal media coverage. They get equal prize money. They are playing, you know, um, all these world tour level events uh, at the at, you know, at the same level of equity. And there are a lot of sports that follow suit, you know, um, men's and women's marathon, they run the same distance, they have access to the same races, they have the same prize purse. 
and, you know, and so on. Uh, we've seen how women's soccer is still going up against struggles of, of pay equity. And um, the same is true in women's cycling, um, where it's so antiquated that uh, the sport, which has been around for a long, long time, you know, the UCI, which is the Union Cycliste International that governs the, the cycling federation, um, they have been around for 119 years and still to this day, women don't have equal access to many of the top tier races. They don't have equal access to um, media coverage in terms of TV coverage or live stream footage. And they don't have, well, they don't, they did not have an equal base salary. That's something that we've challenged along the way. The good news is that as of 2020, the women's professional world tour level will introduce a base salary for all, you know, women's world tour level teams. Um, and they are building that as a three year incremental process. So for example, the base salary for men at the, at the world tour level is, um, roughly around 40,000 Euro. And of course, many athletes at that level are paid far beyond that, but at least everybody is guaranteed 40,000 Euro and women, they're starting the women in 2020 at 15, thousand and then we'll build up the next year 25 i believe and then to 30 and then by the by the third year slash fourth year it'll be fully equal so on one hand it's a little bit laughable that you can't just jump right to the equity (laughs) but i also understand that many of the teams that are in place right now the world tour teams actually do need a little bit of a helping hand in building relationships with investors that will, um, provide equal salary. Um, you know, and sometimes that takes a few years to build. So I'm thrilled that it's happening, that it's starting and that it's coming now in 2020. The ridiculous part is how hard we had to fight for that. You know, to think that in 2013, the president of the UCI, Pat McQuaid was saying, um, oh, you know, yeah, no, women don't, don't deserve a a base salary. You know, it was that antiquated thinking. So to think in the past six years that we've lobbied enough and pressured enough that, yes, finally, they're acknowledging that women do. But now where we need the pieces to come together is uh, is the media equal opportunity, because how will we attract more sponsors to the sport if they don't have a visible outlet to be seen? And that comes in with a equal media investment and then two equal opportunity. And you know this from when we talked back in 2015, that there are still world tour level races that do not offer a women's field. And the Tour de France, even though we made huge progress by they finally have, um, you know, have created La Course. We have one day racing at the Tour de France. And that one day is huge. It's a game changer and it's a door opener. But the same point, ASO, which runs the Tour de France, they were supposed to include multiple days of races each year since the first debut of La Course in 2014. And they have failed their promise. They are just sticking with the one day format, which is now becoming more like tokenism rather than actual growth. So, um, and of course it's very important at the Tour de France because that's the world's biggest bike race. And, um, and that's what we're up against. We're up against these antiquated systems that think, oh yes, of course we have equality for women. Look, we have one day. We're like, nope, not enough. And, um, you know, a lot of people will argue and they'll say, well, the women, they don't need uh, to quote unquote piggyback on the men and have their, have a women's tour de France at the same time. And I said, you know, they, they don't necessarily need to have the women's tour de France run at the same time as the men, but a it's financially more lucrative to actually include two races at one course rather than have to shut down all of the same streets, you know, a month later to run the the women's. It's not only financially more lucrative to run two races during the same time, but it's also um, ecologically better. It's, you know, more environmentally friendly to, to do that, uh, to have the men and women there racing um, at the same time. And when I say at the same time, I don't mean at the same minute, but, you know, a delayed start for each. And uh, so that's where we are right now a little bit is trying to get break through this antiquated, as I like to call it, dinosaur thinking that uh, the women 
um, have progressed to this amazing level where there are races are just as exciting as the men's races. And that's why it needs to be seen, you know, the same time, the same place, the same visibility and access like we see in other sports. I'm just, I'm so angry. Like, I'm just so <laughs> Good. angry. Good. I just don't, I mean, I obviously, you know, I love what you do, fully support it. And obviously the Tour de France, it pisses me off every year I see it. Yes. People don't even know that there isn't a women's race. And it's just like, and obviously you will have heard of the International Ls who who, who race oh, yeah. the, the day before and are doing a phenomenal job of, of raising awareness. But it is this, it's this catch-22 exactly as you described. It's this lack of media. It's this lack of sponsorship. You can't get a sponsorship because you don't get the media. You don't get the media because you don't get the sponsorship. And then you're obviously battling with these outdated dinosaurs Oh my god! Okay, breathe, Sarah. Calm. Um, can you? Just, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. No. I'm glad you're angry. We should be angry about that, and it's great to have that type of emotion. And just what you said that you know, so many people don't realize that there isn't a women's equivalent because they assume we fall through the loopholes of assumption. They assume it's 2019. Every other sport has a women's um, equal playing field to it. So I'm sure the Tour de France does too. We might not be seeing it, but it it must be there, right? And then we have to tell them, no, it doesn't exist. And I love what the internationals did. It's so important that we remind people that they did not race. This was a group of amazing women who were out there riding the same route of the Tour de France a day before the race to promote awareness that, Hey, women can do this too. Right. So they didn't, they weren't racing, they were riding. And the reason that that's really important is because, um, it, it, we have to show people that, that women's racing and women's riding are, are two very different things and they played a huge part, but we also have to make sure that the public doesn't see like, Oh, look, women are riding the day before. Therefore everything's taken care of. It must be equal now. It's like, no, they're riding to raise awareness so the female pro athletes can race. And I think all of us who are in the sport see that, but sometimes it's, it's tough to make that connection to the outside world of people, you know, who are, who are not as familiar with cycling. <laughs> and, and, you know, the other thing is, it's almost unfortunate that internationals actually has to prove this to people that, Hey, look, women are capable too, because back in the mid eighties and also in the mid fifties, there was a women's field at the tour de France. So it, we've already proven that we can, that females can race the tour de France. And it's, it's, um, it's sad that now here we are in 2019 and we actually need a group of women to remind the public that this is possible. Right. So we support them 100 percent. But it's also such a shame that they have to sink so much resource and attention into just proving that women are capable. Tell me more about your approach and how you're making how you're you are trying to change this and and, and make an impact in this uh, in this field, in this area. Yeah. So I think um, people have known since I've been in the sport, you know, my first pro contract was in 2012 and I was making a film on women cycling half the road, which is still out there and people are still watching and downloading. It's on iTunes, Vimeo and Amazon Prime. So you can see it. It's great that it's still being um, viewed, which is awesome. Um, Where I was going with that is that that was my introduction into, you know, how um, unequal this, this world of, of women's pro cycling is, and we need to get the word out there. And so the film opened the the gateway back then I was also racing professionally, which gave me the access to all of these amazing women to interview and talk to, um, not just women, but men too. And that was very helpful because I was still racing and I was a voice in the sport, but a lot of women, you know, were, um, were not comfortable with speaking out. You know, they saw that I was speaking out and they saw the the feedback or the internet trolls and, you know, anything that can happen when somebody stands up for what they believe in. I got a lot of negativity hurled my way too because people were so afraid of change, you know, like, oh, look at this woman talking about cycling and equality and all of these flaws that are happening behind the scenes that we don't know about. You know, that made people uncomfortable at a point kind of watching and wondering, well, what's going to happen if I speak out? And many of them didn't want to. There were also contracts and there still are to this day, there are pro contracts that ask 
um, the athletes of that team not to speak out about um, inequality, or they ask that any interview that athlete is is asked to give, um, that has to be almost um, checked over and looked into by that team's media department before they let an athlete speak. And then you'll get all these bubbly answers like, oh, yay, women's cycling, it's great, because there are still some teams that are antiquated that believe, like, don't say anything bad about the sport or you know, it'll make us look bad. So that is something I was very in tune with when I did make the choice to speak out. And here's the good news. Once the film came out and more people understood that this was, it, this wasn't just happening to one cyclist, this was happening to all cyclists, more and more athletes felt comfortable speaking out. So I fully believe that change has to come from within. So now I'm retired from the sport and I am doing everything I can, but behind the scenes, lobbying ASO, lobbying the um, UCI to make changes. But the most effective voices will come from the athletes who are currently racing. And, you know, it, we can look back in history and see where this is working. For example, women's soccer. It's the current women's national team and current women's professional players that have lobbied by creating the, uh, the lawsuit, you know, against FIFA for, for unequal pay. That was huge. That was huge. And then Billie Jean King back in the 70s, she was lobbying for change and she was currently a professional athlete in tennis. So that's where we need more of the, um, the athletes who are currently racing to gather their courage and stand up and speak out. And the good news is that's happening. We're seeing that happening. We're seeing more women use their voice to create that change. You're so strong to do this because it, it must be wearing after a while, you know, sort of, I think you said it was yes. like six years to, to try and get the, you know, the, the payment and, you know, equal pay. And, you know, that's going to take another three years. And, and by then the men's salary will have increased and then the women's salary will be probably be 20,000 euros behind where, where the men's are. Sorry, that's like a dampener. <laughs> but focusing <laughs> on the positive. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And it is exhausting. And I, I'll be very honest with you about this too because currently I'm, I'm working on a book about this journey, about, you know, um, everything that has, uh, has kind of consumed my life from 20, sorry, 2009, when I first reached out to ASO, like my first burst into the activism part, you know, up till, um, the Homestretch Foundation, I'm working on a book to share the journey that a, anybody can create change. Look, if I can do it and I'm not, um, I'm not, a wealthy, uh, a wealthy person. I'm not an Olympic gold medalist. I'm not famous. If I was able to create all this change, then it should be proof that we all are capable. That's the message I want the book to get across, but it also needs to get across the fact that activism is almost, um, it's, it's a very difficult, sometimes even dangerous journey because, it does take so much out of the person who is fighting for change that just to go into it blindly can leave one absolutely devastated and, you know, uh, absolutely crushed at how much of your personal life and your your entire being can be absorbed by this. Um, and how do we create boundaries for that? You know, how do we stop and pause and say, hey, hey, hey you know, it's okay to rest for a bit, you know, like we, just like we need in training, <laughs> the rest days are important and we need to use that tactic and activism too. And to, you know, not go so far all in that we feel like we're drowning. And I know it hit me really, really hard. I went through some big life changes that were devastating and ugly and depressing, like divorce, like losing my job, losing team contracts. Everything that I was fighting for was, directly affecting or an effect from my personal life too. And it would be false for me to write a book that sounded like, Hey, activism is great. It's all, you know, happy sunshine and rainbows. Cause it's not, I don't think it's okay for, for, um, books or film or, or anything to create this, this, um, false promise that like, well, if you believe in what you're doing, everything's going to work out great. Like sometimes stuff doesn't work out great. And, and we need to tell people that too. People don't necessarily see be what goes on behind the scenes. They may see your successes or they may see the, the failures or the things that, that don't happen. And I'm, and I'm glad, I'm really glad you shared that. Uh, when's the book going to be coming out? 
basically, um, we're in a really interesting time right now with publishing. Um, and to give a little bit of backstory to this, the book I'm working on now, it's my fourth book, right? Uh, my first book came out in 2003, my next one in 2010, my third in 2014. All three of those books were published by very reputable publishing houses like Little Brown and Random House and ESPN Books. These were big publishers. And I also have a literary agent. So at this stage in the game, I should be able to go to a publishing house and say, okay, here's my manuscript. Let's make a deal. Let's get this done. And um, I've proven myself, you know, as a writer. And what we're running into now is that the, these publishing houses are in a place where many of them are only accepting manuscripts and books, which they believe can quote unquote sell. And they're getting their basis for that on what's already out there and what's already selling. So, you know, I challenge anyone to go look at the bestseller list in their country uh, or their city or their, you know, wherever you are. <laughs> and you will see that on these bestseller lists, so many concepts and, and um, titles, especially in nonfiction, are, um, are not necessarily unique they are almost carbon copies of something that's come out before. So for example, books on, in, at least, and I, I'm saying this from the US, we're, we're always going to have a book by somebody in the military that's told a journey or a story. We're going to have a book about somebody who's had a wonderful experience with a dog that's taught them something about the meaning of life. And then we're going to have politicians and then we're going to have Hollywood celebrities. It's so rare that we find nonfiction books anymore that actually stand their ground. And and hold some level of individuality or uniqueness or um, originality. And that's really what, what writing is supposed to be about. So back in the day, all of the, the books that I had come out were unique, you know, um, and there hadn't been something out there like them before. And now here we are again, this book ties in the, um, the effect of not just sports, honestly, that's, that's just part of it. But this book really is talking about what it takes to stand up and create change, how we're all capable of making that happen. And, you know, again, there's this underlying theme too, of for a woman to stand up and fight against sexism and, and traditionalism and inequality. And my agent has received at least 15 rejections from publishers who are citing like, oh, hey, you know, she can write. She's, she's a good writer. But yeah, we just don't think books that involve equality or activism are going to sell. <laughs> and I am thinking, oh, my gosh, are you not looking at our political and social climate right now? Because from where we sit in the U.S., that's going to be pretty marketable. <laughs> I think everybody who listens to the Tough Girl podcast would want to buy it. I'm like, I want to read Thank this book. You. Like, oh my God, there is a market and there is an Thank audience. You. What are you going to do? Are you going to self-publish or are you going to continue trying to get a, a publisher? I love that you asked that. So here's where I am. Um, as the, the book proposal, so where I am right now, I'm almost done with the first draft. I'm 300 pages in. There's plenty of material. It's it's not going to be short. Um if my agent cannot secure a book deal by the time I'm on that second draft, working through the details and the fine, you know, fine tuning, if, yeah. So, you know, if six months from now there's, uh, there's no book deal on the table and I'm closing in on the, on the final edits of that second draft, then I will self-publish. The reason that I don't want to self-publish is that when you publish with a major publishing corporation, you have more outreach, right? You're going to be in more bookstores. You're going to be working with a publicist. You're going to have a little bit more availability for the book to um, tangibly live in many places. And I also think it's really important that our, our corporate publishing companies actually invest in equality and they invest in change makers and that they invest in women who stand up to um, to change the patriarchal systems. I think our publishing companies need to invest in that. So that's why I'm taking this route of saying, hey, like open your eyes. Let's let's make this book happen. Let's make an impact together. And if I still continue to get this um, dinosaur mentality, <laughs> then hell yes, I will self-publish and I'll make a big stink about that <laughs> as to why I have to self-publish. 
if that's where it goes, then that's where it goes. And at first that really used to make me kind of depressed and kind of angry and sad. And then I really had to change my thinking and saying like, no, 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 if this is how it's going to be, I'm going to rile the troops and get as many people as we can on my side of saying, yeah, yeah, corporate publishing. If you don't believe in her, then we'll buy one of her self published books. And we will send the message that, yes, this is the book we want to read. So knock on wood, hopefully you and your fabulous listeners will back me if it comes to that. So it's probably a room, the senior management are all probably going to be men, there's going to be one woman at the table. Uh, Okay, I I don't want to go down a Mm ranty route. Mm -hmm. I love it. (laughs) Oh my god, I I love it so many times. So Catherine, how are you funding your lifestyle at the moment now that you're no longer um, a professional athlete? Are you are you able to make money from home stretch? Is is that sort of an income earning, or, or because obviously you know it's a non profit, um, or are you doing any, anything else to 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 to? Oh, I yeah. love that you're asking this question. I think it's so important. I think that um, we often live in a society that doesn't want to talk about salary or income, or that has to be kept very private and hush hush. And, um, people don't know how much goes on behind the scenes of struggle. I cannot tell you, Sarah, how many times people will say to me, Oh, I've seen what you've done and you're so successful and, and you've got your, you've got it all together. And they don't realize that behind the scenes, how much hustling has to go on just to keep going (laughs) so that I can financially eat and pay rent and do all the things that we normal human beings have to do to get by. Right. So, um, to answer your question, uh, with all the different hats that I wear, um, I, I don't have a salary at the home stretch. I did have a stipend for the first few years. Now I don't, all of the funding that we get for home stretch goes right into paying the, the, the bills that are associated with the, um, the living establishment that's here. I live in the guest house of that. So I get a bit of a break on rent and utilities, but this is also, it's not the home that I personally own. So I don't have equity in that sense. So how I, um, earn and get by on a day-to-day basis is this. Last year, I was brought on as an ambassador with Trek Bicycles, and I have a, or have slash had, because we're now at that time of year, will I have this position again in 2020? Who knows? But for this past year, I had um, a salary that came in through the speaking engagements and the ambassador work that I did with Trek Bicycles. Also, also I worked as a public speaker and I was, I worked freelance going to universities and corporations to share with them the message, um, that this book will also be about, which is how we can all stand up, fight for change and, um, how that not only helps change the sport, but it also helps change the financial infrastructure of, um, of cycling, you know, so I would do public speaking and then, um, I'll do freelance gigs as well. So anything that I can do to keep myself self afloat as I, um, fight for change is, uh, you know, it's kind of an ongoing, um, I don't know if I want to use the term battle or struggle, but I can tell you that there are definitely times where when I hear someone say like, oh, you're successful and you're doing great things for this sport, it feels great. But I'm also thinking to myself, like, um, am I going to be able to keep doing this or am I going to have to do a total different career switch just to make it to get by like everybody else does? So it's scary. It's a scary thing. Um, and it's, you know, hopefully something that if, if I can sell this book, that'll add to something that'll help me get by as well. So it's a really interesting thing to see that paths in activism, um, are never truly clear cut. And I've been drawn to this field. I, it makes me feel good, um, to, to help this world move forward just a little bit. I get so much joy from that, but it absolutely scares me to death to think too, like, wow, you know, I'm 44 years old and I don't have the savings that other people probably have (laughs) by this point in life. And, um, it's definitely a nerve wracking position, but I also really like talking honestly and openly about that. Um, so that it gets the message out there that, you know, activists don't always have the easiest, easiest journey. 
I think it's really interesting because um, a lot of people have said to me recently, oh, you know, you're so successful, especially with the Tough Girl podcast. You've won, I won another award, uh, the She Extreme's Best Adventure podcast this year. And, you know, hitting, well, we're going to hit like a, a million downloads. And then I'm thinking Ooh. to myself, but I'm still working two part-time jobs. I go and wash dishes. <laughs> you know, yes, I do yes, yes. And I think <laughs> the, the, the interesting thing is, as well is it's almost, you know, the work you are doing is so important, but actually you're almost sort of being, you're being penalized for following your following a passion and helping to drive this change through for, for the younger generations, which is so, so important so that when future cyclists come through, that they are going to be able to earn a, a, a living wage and to be able to, to, to race in the Tour de France, etc. But then also this by not earning money now, it then it's going to impact on, you know, your retirement will you be able to retire will you have funds for 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 a pension and and, you know it's right it's awful to be able to think you know to to think that actually you do need to think like this and because I go from a banking background I do think of like pensions and retirement and be able to you know support will I be able to support myself financially in 20 years time bearing in mind now you know I do live at home with um with my parents while I'm this big success with the with the podcast I get it. Yeah. No, I, I, do you know what? I, I really do appreciate that. And do you know what? I want to do a big shout out to Trek Bikes as well because I love that you are working as an ambassador for them and t- to Thank talk you. about equality in cycling because actually we need to support those companies who are supporting yes. women and it's so, so important. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. I agree. And it's so interesting for me now where I am at this point in the season, you know, we have the negotiations with Trek. Are you going to keep me on? Can I count on this for next year? And it's always like, okay, so now I'm in that, um, that magical place where I just wait and see what comes back. And it puts me at that mercy again. Will I be hired to keep doing what I've been doing this past year? Or will they say, no, thanks for your time. We appreciate it, but we're moving on. You know, it's, it's a scary thing to be in that place where you constantly have to wonder um, will this keep moving forward? So I completely applaud track for what they've, they've brought to the table this year. I also wish it weren't in that way of, um, you know, where we constantly have to say, okay, am I worthy again next year? (laughs) Or do we have to renegotiate? You know, it's a scary thing. And I know that a lot of pro athletes feel that way too. They've got their contract. They're all set for a year, but then they get to that point at the end of the season and like, well, what happens next? It's still, um, and and I don't know if this is relevant just to cycling or, or activism, but to constantly feel like you have to keep proving yourself in some way, um, is, is something that I feel like if we didn't have to put so much energy into proving ourselves, but we could actually do the work that we do and let that work speak for itself and be guaranteed a little bit more of an investment of like, yes, we want to keep, we want you to keep doing what you're doing. That would make it so much easier. And I think don't underestimate or people shouldn't underestimate actually dealing with that uncertainty. It's a, Mm -hmm. it's a constant stress on your life or living like trying to think like how am I gonna how am I gonna pay the bill like just it's always there it's always it's this it's this pressure it's this weight on your shoulders and yeah. you are by the way you are worthy you are worthy thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you so so are you <laughs> thank you it's weird it is and I realize that there are probably some personal demons in there for me that just kind of float up to the surface at this time when um, I'm in that that place where it's like I've done some some successful things for this sport and for, you know, for others. And that feels great. And it's awesome. But of course, you know, those demons rise again, every time we have to go out there and prove ourselves, like, are we worth it? You know, and I really need to, um, and actually that very topic comes up in the book, you know, these, um, everybody struggles with something personally, and that might be different for everybody. But for me and the amount of times I've had to, you know, go back to the drawing board and look for investors in stuff that usually doesn't actually end in an investment in me financially, but an investment in what I'm, I'm doing to get off the ground, like half the road or the home stretch or the petition for women to getting, you know, um, uh, to race at the tour de France. I've had amazing, incredible, tremendous support, both emotionally and financially in getting those projects off the ground. But I think people don't know that behind the scenes, 
that money doesn't actually go into my bank account. <laughs> that goes into the projects, you know? So, um, it's, it's, that's one of those things. that's just like, um, the reality of, of what it is to be an activist. So Catherine, what can, what can we do? What can the women and the men who are listening to this episode how can we help? How can we support? What, what can we do? Thank you. Thank you so much for asking that. Let's see. Okay. Um, I definitely have a donation page on my website, katherinebertine.com. Anything that comes in through there, that goes to my basic living expenses so that I can keep doing what I'm doing. Um, at homestretchfoundation.org, anybody who donates to Homestretch Foundation, that always helps our, you know, our foundation thrive and that keeps the house up and running, keeps that going. So those are two different areas, um, where, you know, hopefully, you know, I've explained one goes to, toward the organizational work. One goes to me, <laughs> feel free to invest in either that rings true for you. Um, and then let's see, um, download, downloading half the road. So you can see where the, uh, where the sport is and where we want it to go. That's always helpful. I get small royalties from that each year, but as you can imagine, royalties on a $3 film um, are probably not what you're envisioning with Hollywood (laughs) film royalties. (laughs) But, you know, annually it'll buy me a bag or two of groceries. So, hey, I do not um, do not want to disparage that at all. But yeah, you know, and I have had donors come through and they've, they've, sometimes, um, given, and they've said, Hey, I see the work that you do. I see what you're doing. And I appreciate that. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll throw something in the pot now. And then I always am so thankful for that. And then when this book comes out, Oh, if you'll jump on the bandwagon and support the book, if I go the route of self-publishing, then that'll be huge. If I go the route of corporate, corporate publishing, either way, someday I will get something from that. <laughs> Absolutely. And we will be here to support you. Oh, thank you. So I want to mix things up a little bit now. I want to do some quick fire questions. So my questions may be quick, but your answers don't have to be. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? (laughs) I'm ready. Okay. Are you a morning person or an evening person? Morning person. But in the winters, I will sleep later than usual. What time does your alarm go off? Right now, seven, but in the summer, the spring and summer, it'll go off at 5.30 to 6. What time do you go to bed? Uh, between 9 and 10. Are you tea or coffee? Tea? I learned from the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, are you Earl Grey or a particular blend? English breakfast PG tips. Are you reading a book at the moment? Uh, yes, I am reading a book at the moment. It's um, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. So good. What about movies? Do you watch movies? Do you ever do, I was going to say Netflix and chill, but that sounds a bit dodgy. Do you ever like binge oh, watch no, no, Netflix? No. <laughs> of course, of course. I definitely watch Netflix um, and I watch movies and I love, I love all movies, especially documentary, as you can imagine, just coming from uh, the, you know, the documentary side. So movies, uh, two movies that I just saw that were fantastic. One is game changers and that that is on Netflix. Um, and the other one is, um, Morgan Spurlock's new documentary. It's called Holy Chicken (laughs) and they're, they're terrific. I'm going to leave that there because I just want the, the viewers to, to trust me that these are two fantastic documentaries and um, you don't have to be vegan or vegetarian to watch these. Um, I'm not, and I was really fascinated by the subject matter. What about music? Do you have a favorite genre, song, uh, you know, type? Oh, I love all music. Um, I grew up playing the drums as an instrument, and I was exposed to such great music from everything from the blues to um, to jazz to rock. So my menu for music is I like a good mix of stuff from the past and things that are current, and I try to go outside the box. It's really hard these days where clear channel systems just want to broadcast all the top you know, top pop music to you. So, um, I, I'm a wide array. I love all types of music. What about food? What's your favorite type of food? Oh, my favorite type of food. If I could rotate through sushi, 
pizza and Mexican on a rotating basis, I would be a very happy camper. I am a very happy camper. <laughs> what do you do for rest and relaxation? Oh, let's see. Um, physically, for relaxation, I like to walk. Um, it, it opens channels in my mind. That makes me happy just to go for a stroll. And that has nothing to do with anything um, workout wise, just to go for a walk, just to be outside. I love that. That relaxes me tremendously. I also love, you know, reading and watching documentaries or, or movies, um, exploring independent films, not always documentaries. It, it, that just makes me happy. Um, anytime that I get to spend in the woods is always relaxing. So those are my things. Do you have a mantra or words that you live your life by? Um, the first thing that jumped into my mind is listen to the gut. The gut knows all. I, I think now, um, I have a better understanding that, uh, it's such a hard thing to articulate, but I always feel like listen to my instincts is something that if I had learned that lesson earlier, um, I probably would have fared better in many ways. So listen to the gut. That's the mantra. Um, I'm, I think I've got a lot, but that's the first one. Do you set goals or, um, you know, like New Year's resolutions every year? Um, I don't. I don't set New Year's resolutions. Um, if anything, what I've learned over the past few years is that uh, probably after going through a brain injury, too, is that you never know what's going to happen um, physically in your life. So there really is some some strength and a real creed to the saying, you know, be happy find a way to access your inner joy because you don't know what's coming. And, um, that to me is almost a resolution that sometimes I need to remind myself of how important it is to make sure that we do things every day in our life that, that give us joy, that make us happy. Oh, that's so beautiful. I was going to say, I was going to ask you for like some, you know, final words of wisdom and advice to leave our listeners with before we go, but you said it so beautifully. Oh, is, is, there, is there anything else that maybe you haven't mentioned that you, that you'd like to add or share? Gosh, Sarah, your interview process is so fantastic. You ask such amazing questions and I feel like, um, we have covered so much and I really want to thank you also for letting me be a little bit open and vulnerable about some of the stuff that, you know, not all podcasts will go to, you know, when we're talking about income or, or personal stuff, you know, it's really important to talk about that. And I think you do such a great job. So I can't think of any doors that I um, haven't, you know, wanted to open because you've opened them all. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, well, it's been, honestly, it's been incredible getting you back on the podcast to catch up. And next time we're not going to leave it as long. <laughs> so it will be amazing to continue, you know, to keep up to date. And, you know, please do let us know um, when the book does, does go live, whether it's corporate or self-published, we will all be behind you and supporting you. And I'll obviously do everything that I can to share it on social media and all that good stuff. Um, oh, but Catherine, thank you. Thank you. You've been an absolute <laughs> superstar and just incredible what you're doing in the world of cycling. I, I love it. It's amazing. Oh, thank you, Sarah, for all that you do for all of us out there listening to you and moving the world forward for women, for everyone. Thank you so much. Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed the episode with Catherine Bertine. What an absolute legend. If you are brand new to the Tough Girl Podcast, then my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl Podcast and the Tough Girl Podcast Extra. And I could not do this without the support of my incredible patrons who are all over the world. So a massive thank you for, for supporting the work that I do and helping me to increase the amount of female role models in the media. It is so, so important. If you want to pay it forward, if you want to give back, if you want to encourage other women to get fit and active and to travel and explore, and to help me to increase the amount of female role models in the media, then please do go check out Patreon, P A T R E O N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast. Now, if you are into cycling, I'm just going to give you a couple of recommendations of podcast episodes that I think that you will enjoy listening to. 
So during the episode, um, Catherine talked about the Tour de France and we mentioned the International L's. Take a listen to Pippa Lyon. So Pippa came on the Tough Girl podcast earlier on in 2019 when she shared more about her planning and preparation for riding the whole route of the Tour de France the day before the male professionals do it. And then we also follow up with Pippa after she's completed that challenge um, on Tough Girl Extra. So that's well worth listening to. If you're interested in um, different types of cycling, um, so for example, I have cycled cycle down the Pacific Coast Highway. You can listen to, there's two podcast episodes that I've done. One is on the planning and preparation for cycling from Vancouver in Canada all the way down to San Diego in Mexico, uh, sorry, down to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. The second podcast episode is more information about that journey and I answer questions from members of the Tough Girl tribe. We've also spoken to Jenny Graham who has got the record for cycling around the world. So uh, Jenny, last year, she cycled 100 in 124 days all the way around the world. An absolute incredible woman. That's over 18,000 miles, 14 continents through 16 um, countries doing the trip just solo and unsupported. So I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that episode. I'd also uh, like to recommend you take a listen to Jasmine Muller as well. Jasmine's into ultra cycling, breaking records, and she also shares more about dealing with failure and saddle sores. On a slightly sort of different note, we've got Rachel Yassim, who's a 49-year-old mother and a full-time adventurer. She's currently cycling the world and living a very nomadic lifestyle on her terms. So, you know, from what I just mentioned, that's just a few of the examples of the cyclists that we've had on the Tough Girl podcast. If you want to hear more or find out more about who I've had on the podcast as guests, then please do go and visit the central hub, which is toughgirlchallenges.com. On the website, you can find links to all of our previous guests, all of our previous episodes. You can find information on the show notes in the Tough Girl blog. There's also links to the books that I've written and also books um, that I have endorsed as well. So, for example, a couple of the most recent books would be The Fantastic Female Adventurers, a Truly Amazing Tales of Women Exploring the World. So this was written by Lily Dew. It's also got a collection of 14, um, yeah, a collection of 14 exciting and inspirational stories um, from incredible women. Many of the women actually that we've had on the Tough Girl podcasts such as Anna McNuff and and Sarah Uten. So very, very inspiring. It's also been beautifully illustrated by Cecile Carroll. Um, So that is the Fantastic Female Adventurers. And I actually wrote the endorsement for the back of that book. For um, for the 40th anniversary of the Tough Girl podcast, I released Tough Girl Top Tips, Life Lessons from the Tough Girl podcast. Um, Be inspired and motivated by stories of adventure and challenges. 40 of the toughest female adventurers in the world have shared top tips to motivate and inspire you as you go after your own personal challenges. So that was given to free to patrons on the 4th of August, which was the 4th year anniversary of the Tough Girl podcast. But I'm selling that in Amazon for £4.11. pence. So please do go um, check that out and support if you can. There's also, I've also got books on the, you know, Running the Marathon to Sarves, Climbing, Kilimanjaro and Shy Hosting. So yeah, go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com to find out more information. I'm very active on social media as well, especially on Instagram. If you want to see where I work, if you want to see where I record the podcast, if you want to see what my life is like behind the scenes, then come and follow along on Instagram at my handle is at Tough Girl Challenges. But again, a big thank you to the patrons um, who are supporting me financially every single month. It makes such a big difference having a regular source of income coming in. And what you're allowing me to do is to pay it forward. You're allowing me to produce more content, to share more stories, to get more women's voices heard. And now more than ever, it is so, so important. So $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, please, please, please consider paying it forward. Patreon.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. Lots of love. I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl podcast. Take care. Bye.